Snow flurries can come so thick and fast from the cold northern sky that the wind that bears them becomes an icy, blinding glare. So too the gleaming polished weaponry, the helmet shields, spears, and plated corselets, all of the bronze paraphernalia of war that issued from the ships. The rising glare reflected off the coppery sky, and the land beneath laughed under the arcing metallic glow. A deep bass thrumming rose from the marching feet, and, like a bronze bolt in the center, Achilles, who now began to arm. His eyes glowed like white-hot steel, and he gritted his teeth against the grief that had sunk into his bones. And every motion he made in putting on the armor forged for him in heaven was an act of passion directed against the Trojans. Clasping on his shins the greaves trimmed in silver at the ankles, strapping the corselet onto his chest, slinging the silver-studded bronze sword around a shoulder, and then lifting the massive heavy shield that spilled light around it as if it were the moon or a fire that is flared up in a lonely settlement high in the hills of an island, reflecting light on the faces of men who have put out to sea and must watch helplessly as rising winds bear them away from their dear ones. So too, the terrible beauty of Achilles' shield, a fire in the sky. He lifted the helmet and placed it on his head, and it shone like a star, with the golden horsehair Hephaestus had set thickly on the crest, rippling in waves. He tested the fit and flex of the armor, sprinting on the sand, and found that the metal lifted him like wings. He pulled from its case his father's spear, the massive, heavy spear that no other Greek but Achilles could handle, made of Pelian ash, which the centaur Chiron had brought down from Mount Pelion and given to Achilles' father to be the death of heroes. Automedon and Alchemist harnessed the horses, cinched the leather straps, fit the bits in their jaws, and drew the reins back to the jointed chariot. Automedon picked up the bright lash and jumped into the car, and behind him, Achilles stepped in shining in his war gear like an amber sun. And in a cold voice, he cried to his father's horses, Xanthus and Balius Podarchy's famous colts, see that you bring your charioteer back safe this time when we have had enough of war, and not leave him for dead as you left Patroclus. And from beneath the yoke, Xanthus spoke back, hooves shimmering, his head bowed so low that his mane swept the ground, as Hera, the white-armed goddess, gave him a voice. This time we will save you, mighty Achilles, this time, but your hour is near. We are not to blame but a great god and strong fate. Nor was it slowness or slackness on our part that allowed the Trojans to despoil Patroclus. No, the best of the gods, fair-haired Leto's son, killed him in the front lines and gave Hector the glory. As for us, we could outrun the west wind which men say he is the swiftest. But it is your destiny to be overpowered by a mortal and a god. Xanthus said this. Then the Furies stopped his voice. And Achilles, greatly troubled, answered him. I don't need you to prophesy my death, Xanthus. 
I know in my bones I will die here far from my father and mother. Still I won't stop until I have made the Trojans sick of war. And with a cry, he drove his horses to the front.